Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence, and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Today's scripture comes from Luke 2, verses 22 through 40. Hear these words. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel." And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanal of the tribe of Asher, She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Not too long ago, I ran across a to-do list that I made at the beginning of 2020. As I looked over it, I remembered how I was so excited for each event and moment that was on that list. It included things like wedding plans, my daughter's 16th birthday, ordination interviews in the hopes of a ceremony to follow, VBS, and my son's 21st birthday. I was so filled with anticipation for each one of these events, and I couldn't wait to share them with family and friends. And then March came. You remember March, right? Things changed. I still got married, but it wasn't the day that I necessarily envisioned, even though it was wonderful. I got ordained, but it also was different. We didn't have a ceremony, but instead were ordained over Zoom. My son turned 21, but it was without all the pomp and circumstance that I had planned. And Vacation Bible School, it still happened, thanks to a dedicated team of people from along the street of Mimosa Boulevard, 
for hundreds of children, but it happened at home, not within the walls of our churches. Everything that I had planned for 2020 suddenly had to change. It's not been the year we expected. Instead, it has been a year that has been pregnant with pandemic, job loss, racial injustice, business shutdowns, and contentious politics. In many ways, it has shaken us to our core and filled us not with anticipation, but with worry, anxiety, and isolation. But what if, what if through all of this, God is giving birth to something transformational? What if during this time, God is inviting us to see something new? Now, if we take a step back for a moment and we look into the Old Testament, we can be reminded that Jesus' story began long ago through people who expressed a great hope and trust in God, even when they didn't know what was ahead. From the first moments that the world fell into brokenness, God promised restoration. And if you go a little further in the Old Testament, you find the story of Abraham and how God called him to what felt like an uncertain journey, sending him only with a string of promises to make of him a great nation that blesses all the people. Throughout the Old Testament, we see this story unfold. And I'm sure that when Abraham responded to God, he didn't think that this would be a nation that would suffer oppression and turmoil throughout its history. But that's what happened. They were subject to other kingdoms. They often turned from God, sinned, and then came back. But throughout the story, we see how people continue to put their hope and trust in God. They knew that God had promised to send someone to redeem them. And each time they came back to that promise. This is a story, the entire story of the Bible, that is marked with blessing and hope for a world of darkness. Their story from the Old Testament is part of our story. And it is through the faithful responses of people that we come to this moment in the temple, in the gospel today, where Mary and Joseph, Simeon and Anna and Jesus meet. And it is the posture of hope and trust that is revealed in the lives of the people in this story who have known a long journey that we see how Jesus brings the thrill of hope so that the weary world rejoices. Mary and Joseph, they've had a hard year. If you look at the calendar, we come to realize that when they come to the temple, it's been about 10 months since their journey began. That means that if you had a 12-month year, it would be about January of the new year when they come to the temple which would mean that their journey began in March. And that year, it's been an emotional roller coaster for them. It's included angels appearing to them, prophecies about a child, and yes, the new baby that was born of a virgin, you know, right before they were supposed to begin their life together in a home. And then there was that travel that separated them from their family and friends right when the baby was born. And now here they are, the parents of a 40-day-year-old child. If you've ever had a newborn in your house or been around a newborn, you know they are exhausted. In the year when they should have celebrated a new marriage, they have been through just a range of emotions and hardship. And it's safe to say that they probably feel weary. Does any of that sound familiar to you? 
Does it resonate with you in some way? But what is interesting is that when we look at their story, we never see them complaining. Instead, we see these lives that are led with complete faithfulness. They believe that they have a divine mission to complete. They're the earthly parents of the Messiah. And I'm sure that they didn't fully know what that meant, but they trusted that God was with them. And they commit to raising Jesus despite not having much to give. And that is how they come to the temple that day, in obedience to the law to make the sacrifice and to present their child to offer him up to God. And then there's Simeon and Anna. Both have the wisdom of age and most likely know something also of physical and emotional weariness. They've waited a lifetime for this moment. Simeon, we are told, is looking forward to the consolation of Israel. He's anticipating a time when an occupied and weary Israel receives comfort from the Lord through the Messiah. And he fully believes that that will happen in his lifetime, that it will happen before he dies. He is an old man with a vast hope who's been standing at his post keeping watch. And now the moment has come. And Anna, she is like people we know. She's a fixture in the temple who has the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. People probably don't even really hardly know her apart from this place. She is pious and a prayer warrior. She lives a life of worship. For some of us, we might think of her kind of as a church mother. You know, the type of person who you always know is going to be at the church, the one who keeps the history, the one who offers sound advice, and the one who tells you that she's praying for you before you even ask. Both Simeon and Anna, like Mary and Joseph, respond with faithfulness and trust. Attentive to the movement of the Holy Spirit, they are led inside the temple to meet the Holy Family. Simeon goes in and he finds Mary and Joseph and he takes the child in his arms and he presents him to the Lord and proclaims that this is the one that he has been waiting for, that Israel has been waiting for. He rejoices in that moment. He has been looking forward to this day for the sake of himself and for his nation all of his life. But he doesn't limit God in that moment. Instead, he says that this child has come for all people. And then Anna comes and she joins Simeon and she begins to praise God. And her words only add power to what he has already said. But where Simeon spoke to God and to Mary and Joseph, Anna speaks to all who will listen and believe and makes public what Simeon has proclaimed in private, that the Messiah has come and is with them in their presence. The responses of these well-seasoned saints as well as these parents then draws us to Jesus. Surrounded by this cloud of witnesses who are invested in his life from the very beginning, who express hopes for him and who tell the parents how to prepare, Jesus is launched into growing into the person that God has created him to be. He has come to transform the world to show us how God loves, to extend grace, and to invite all people. He changes everything. He turns lives upside down for the good, and he shows us how the first will be last, and the last will be first. As Simeon says, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many. 
to better understand what that really means, it might be helpful for us to think about how the world's culture tells us that things are ordered versus how Scripture tells us that things are ordered. In the world, we have the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, the rise and fall of celebrities, the rise and fall of industries. We value things that start at the top and then only take note when they descend downward. But Jesus shows a different way. To follow Jesus, we must lay down our lives. We hear in the scripture that a grain of wheat must fall to the ground in order to produce abundant fruit. And when trouble came, Jesus didn't just ascend to heaven, but instead lays down his life and is raised in glory. Jesus' response to the mission that God has given us shows us the special concern for the poor, the underdogs, the sick, and the lonely. He teaches us to love God and care not only for ourselves, but for others. Jesus responds by saving the lives of all who believe. Jesus brings hope to a world that is in darkness and blessing through faith. 2,000 years ago, people responded to the birth of Jesus and believed God's promises to make all things new. They looked forward, not back. They believed in renewal. And their responses teach us. They help us to see how our responses to Jesus transform lives. From Abraham to this moment in the temple, people actively respond in faith from a posture of hope and trust. But what does that mean for us? When I looked back at my list from January, I realized that I had to have deep trust throughout this year. We all did. We didn't get to dictate the dates of our big plans, to celebrate events and holidays in the ways that we thought we would. Some of us, we didn't even get to say goodbye to those that we loved who went to be with God in the ways that we would have hoped. Likewise, we didn't get together for worship or mark special events like VBS in the usual ways We didn't go about business as usual. Instead, we stood in lines at stores. We put on masks, and we did our best to keep our distance. We have done lots of hard things this year that can make us feel weary. They make us want to just see the minutes tick by on the clock until the calendar turns to a new month and a new year. Yet in this time, I believe that God is transforming us and the world. Christ has set us free. We just have to see. Releasing control leads us to lean into God more. Not being able to do things as we have done them before causes us to have to use the creativity that God has gifted us with to reimagine how to share the love of Christ. Having to exchange what we want to do for when and when we want to do it for a time of doing what's best for all people has increased our awareness and love for our neighbors. Being apart in many ways has drawn us closer together. Through the difficulties of this year, God has been working for good. Young families tell how they have rediscovered the joy of sitting at the dinner table with their children. Others have shared with me how they have spent more time outside appreciating and enjoying God's creation. And still others have told me how they have learned to share their gifts in different ways so that people knew that they were not alone and that they were loved. We have put our hope in God this year and the things of Christ rather than the world. We've laid down our personal desires so that all might flourish 
And we have looked forward to a new time while also recognizing that in the present moment, God has provided all that we need. It's these kinds of responses on this first Sunday after Christmas that can lead us who are weary to rejoice. We can rejoice because Christ has come and will come again. We can rejoice because Christ offers eternal life now and forever. We can rejoice because he brings the gifts of love, peace, joy, and the thrill of hope to all who receive him. We can know God's presence is with us. We can be filled with wonder and grow closer to one another as we take care of our community. We can respond with faith, not knowing what is ahead, but trusting that the light is shining in the darkness. We can see how God orders chaos. God changed the world when Christ was born, and nothing changes this. 2020, it's not been the year that we expected. It's been different. We all know that. And in a few days, those clocks will tick and that calendar will turn. And honestly, things may not be very different. But how we respond, that can be different. We can remember that our hope is not in clocks and calendars or the status quo. We can grow in our care of others who are in need and who know difficulty. Like Mary and Joseph, we've had nine, almost ten long months. And like Simeon and Anna, We have waited. So whether we are preaching and reminding ourselves of the good news or we are sharing the good news with others, we can put our hope and trust in Jesus' power to overcome the darkness. We can respond from a posture of faithfulness and praise and trust. And we can offer this year and ourselves up to God. The weary world rejoices and we can join the chorus. Let us pray. Eternal God, we are so thankful for this time together, for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who redeems and restores us who renews us. Lord, we pray that as these days move forward, that we will fill your tangible presence with us and that we will respond faithfully from a posture of hope and trust that you have not left us, but instead, Emmanuel, God is with us. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. If you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life, and my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it.
Thank you for joining us.